start my recording. All right, gentlemen. Here we go. Process chromatography part B. So the last one we did was part A and it was mostly um, to deal with gas chromatography. This one's uh, going to be mostly with liquid. You're going to see, you're going to hear the same, some of the same terms for sure. All right. Process chromatography part B, and that's ILM 310404AB. Get this right out of the way here. Okay, learning objectives of this ILM describe the components of liquid chromato uh, chromograph, chrom uh, chromatograph. Um, so we're just going to describe what, what's in it. Describe the detectors used in liquid chromatography. We're going to uh, describe sample systems and sample conditioning as they apply to chromatography. Um, this is one that's going to be very important because most of this uh, analyzers require some sort of sample system. And if the sample system isn't working properly, the uh, majority of our errors are from the sample system. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And explain multi-stream uh, sample switching techniques. So the, in this case, it would be uh, one, uh, one analyzer, uh, but it's having multiple streams from different process points. So we can actually switch on and switch off different uh, sample points and, and what we're sampling uh, from the process. So we explain the multi-stream sample switching techniques. And the, other, the last thing on here, oh yeah, describe the hazards of safe work practices related to chromatography and their sample systems. So I don't know if you guys have ever um, worked on analyzers, but sometimes they have their own little shack or, or place. Um, so there are some uh, definite safety hazards uh, in these shacks, such as um, um, compressed gases. And um, if you're using hydrogen as your mobile phase, things like that. There's there's lots of um, um, safety hazards that we'll talk about at the end. So um, page numbers again, uh, what uh, my, uh, my version is 22. Um, again, it should be pretty close to everything you guys got. And if you got something older, um, the, the material is going to be the same. So when we use HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography, it's called, and I forgot a bracket here. Mobile phase is under thousands of PSI. When samples cannot be vaporized, wow, when sample decomposes when it's heated, um, inorganic salts with boiling points over a thousand. So this is, this is um, when we put the mobile phase under high pressures. And, and again, it says thousands of PSIs. So high pressure pump, um, these, are, these are positive displacement pumps. Um, with this high performance liquid chromatography and using these pumps, you can get leaking, leaks and, and clogging the, uh, plugging the column. Um, no universal methods. Each sample requires special solvents, columns and detectors. So every time we have a, uh, every time we determine what we are going to analyze and detect, um, we use different columns and detectors and solvents and all that kind of stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we get in. And then again, um, one of the issues is advanced chemical knowledge. Um, as far as instrumentation tech, we won't be doing this. Um, this will be all done mm -hmm. above us. And uh, then it'll be put into uh, then it'll be put into uh, uh, all the specs that we need. It'll already be done for us. So when we look at this, we look at a liquid chromatography block diagram, page three. We have the solvent reservoir here, so we need all this solvent. Um, basically, 
this reservoir uh, houses all the solvent we will need for uh, continuous um, operation of the detector of the sample system and the um, uh, chromatograph. Um, here we've got the high speed pump, not the high speed pump, the high pressure pump. Um, you've got the injection point here, and this is going to be like our rotary valves. We talked about those rotary valves, the six point rotary valves. You get your sample in, the sample out. Um, it goes into a column guard, they call it, for liquid chromatography. So this column guard is going to um, basically um, stop any uh, debris, water, or whatever is going in here, stops it from getting into the main column. The main column goes to the detector, and then the, the waste solvent recovery, somehow we're going to have to recover that, uh, that uh, solution and the sample that have come through. Um, and that's that's a task in itself, and we'll talk about that later too. And then, of course, we have the program uh, chrom chromatograph programmer controller right here. So that sample times, how much uh, the switching of the uh, of the valve, things like that. So HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography. So when I look at this column guard, this is the the first to plug off. Um, basically, it's protecting the main column, and when it does plug off, um, it's a lot cheaper to um, change out this column guard than it is to take out the main column. This is a lot more expensive. So the solvent reservoir, um, the reservoir must be degassed and filtered. So we don't want any air pockets in there. We don't want any um, uh, solids in there at all. Like. Uh, you know, even fine uh, micron particles and things like that. So the wet, uh, so we must degas and filter the reservoir. And the reason bubbles interfere with the flow through the column and detect a response. So they're eliminated by a degas or filter. Solids must be removed when they plug the columns. And we get into the size uh, of the of the uh, particles that are allowed to get in and it's under under two microns. Uh, polarity of the solvent must not affect how the sample interacts with the stationary phase. Um, when we talk about polarities, we talk about um, uh, like polarities, uh, dissolving like polarities and, and uh, unlike polarities or dissimilar polarities. Um, they don't mix very well. So the polarity of the solvent ha has to be uh, good for our sample. So we look at the high pressure pump on page four. Um, it's got, it's, it's a reciprocating pump, but it is positive pressure. Uh, this is the outlet goes to the column and this is the inlet check valve. And when this, when this pumps here, it pulls this in and your Basically, uh, from your reservoir, it gets sucked into here, and then on the, on the output stroke, this closes, this opens, and, and it's pumped out to your column. So, of course, this is mo mostly motor-driven, uh, these pump, high-pressure pumps. The pump needs to produce pressure more than 34.5 megapascals, which is about 5,000 PSI. So... Because this is a direct and positive displacement pump, pulsation dampener reduces the pressure fluctuation. So you don't want different pressures going back and forth, back and forth um, uh, into the into the system. So right here, I put a pulsation dampener, and they're, they're as small as this. You know, they're, they're these little pulsation. I think we learned about that in first year, how they work. But they just avoid avoid this constant on-off pressure from the pump. Um, so you put the pulsation on the on the output, and this goes to the column guard. This point here. So they talk a little bit about pulsation dampeners in the, in page four. Rotary uh, in, uh, injection valve or rotary valve that uh, strengthens for rated for high pressure. So they're not like a gas chromatograph. Um, they're rated for high pressure. So there's uh, thicker steel and more bolts and all that kind of stuff. And we talked about this, and those are those. This this one here is the only one we'll talk about um, in the in the liquid chromatograph. 
So again, if you look at A, your sample goes in, uh, it goes through a sample loop, and then it goes out. So it's continually moving. And this sample out um, is what we have to get rid of as far as waste. Um, when it switches over, so the sample goes in and out, and whatever's trapped in this sample loop, um, the liquid solvent pushes through four or three and pushes this all over to the column guard. So the amount of switching and all that kind of stuff and the time of switching is all done by the um, controller. Column guard is the next item. It's placed in front of the main column uh, to protect the main column from being plugged or damaged but from impurities. As I say, it's a lot easier to change the column guard than it is to change the, the main guard or the main um, column. They're short, 20 millimeters to one inch. So there's not much to them, very short. Now the main column, liquid uh, columns are more efficient than gas columns. Typically 30 centimeters or one foot in length. Types of column stationary phase, liquid. Your stationary phase can be liquid, it can be a solid. And it can be size exclusion. And the last one is ion exchange. Um, we'll talk about these a little later, uh, about the columns and, and how they work. So normal phase is liquid. Stationary phase is more polar than the solvent, which is the mobile phase. Um, when I, this, is, this is called the normal phase. When the stationary phase is more pol uh, polar than the solvent, and this is the reverse phase, when the stationary phase is less polar than the solvent. And this is all to do with, uh, with um, absorption and things like that through the, through the liquid phase. Compounds similar in polarity to stationary phase travel slower. Compounds with similar polarity to a mobile phase travel faster. So this is why it's important for us to know our chemical reactions and things like that, or not us, but to get them um, specked out. Compounds absorb to the solid columns rather than dissolve. Solvents displace the compounds that have been absorbed and moves them through the column. So again, some, some of the compounds uh, that we're analyzing, they get absorbed into the solid columns and then eventually the, uh, um, the mobile solvent displaces them and throws them uh, through uh, to the detector. Or we, where we get a chromatograph made. Sorry. So size exclusion columns. Um, it's funny because when I look at this and I first see this, I'm looking at well, why would the why would the larger, bigger polymer molecules move faster through this? Um, and the reason is um, because the, there's porous solid packings. So this size exclusion has poor solid packings and these little guys get caught in the pores where the, the larger ones don't. As the solvent pushes through, the larger ones are coming through first. The, the, uh, the smaller compounds get caught up in the pores of the size exclusion column. So the, the larger uh, molecules come out faster. So separates according to size obviously from the name size exclusion. Small molecules get stuck in the pores, big molecules pass through. Now we get ion exchange, a stationary phase. So this one separates charge molecules, which are a uh, charge molecules called an ion, with opposing charge of a stationary phase. And here, we got a, we, here we've got a positive ion, which is going to be a cation, and a, a negative is anion. So cation exchange stationary phase and anion exchange. As you can see, they're opposite, so they get absorbed. And then the liquid uh, mobile phase eventually pulls them away. Uh, cation exchange analyzes positively charged ions, and uh, anion exchange uh, analyze negatively charged ions. 
and all that makes sense because the stationary phase is, is opposite the polarity of the of the ions the cation iodine or anion ion exchange separates is based on polarity of the sample of the solvent and of the stationary phase Common application for ion exchange are environmental water samples, uh, water treatment plants, and boiler feed water. So a lot, lots to do with the water when I have a ion exchange stationary phase. Detector of an programmer controller. We'll talk about the detector uh, produces electronic signal. No different than uh, well, it is different uh, because I'll show you a couple uh, uh, slides at the end there how they work. Uh, specifically made for compound they analyze. So again, it's the specs here for what we're going to get for a detector. Um, oven, temperature fluctuated. Um, temperature fluctuations are affected by volume injection, um, retention times, detector signal. So again, as in gas uh, uh, chromatography, liquid chromatography has an oven, and it's, cr it's uh, critical for these oven temperatures to stay the same to get, to get um, a good analysis. Programmer controller, control solvent pump and sample injection valve, um, a pro a process of detector signal retention time and peak areas. Um, we don't do any calculations in this uh, ILM uh, because we know how to do them from the first ILM and it's no different where you have your retention times and your, your uh, um, chromatograph response time, things like that. Determine sample composition from all the data that it seeks. So that would be your retention time, how much of a signal you get, and then of course the peak areas from the chromatograph. Provides communication for analytical results. So that's your program controller. One of the things about the, uh, okay, now you can ask your questions one to five. Learning objective number two, describe the detectors used in liquid chromatography. Um, on this here, uh, so basically we have this pressure solvent and then the column, uh, obviously, obviously before this we have a column guard, it goes into the detector. Um, one of the things that, um, we're going to learn is that we have low volume here we have a low volume that goes through the detector and then we have an output um, here's our, our chromatograph um, one of the things about liquid chromatography the detectors also the liquid chromatography goes through the, the liquid phase goes through here too so it's also being detected and so this is where you've got this all these little small little noise it's called noise so little peaks um, and then you get these larger peaks and it has this yellow part here which means it's undetected so if the peak isn't at least three times the um, the tech um, the size of the noise then it won't even be picked up so let's just let's go through this a little bit. Plot the chromatograph of retention times and peak area. Um, the ability of a liquid chroma, uh, chroma, chromatograph to use small and narrow peaks is going to be incre increases the accuracy. Calibration of analyzer determines the response factor. So the response factor is of the actual analyzer, the chromatograph. They maintain a lower narrow peak with low internal volume. So your peak area is low, um, which gives us better representation of, the, of what we're analyzing. Have high sensitivity. Um, here we are with a, the low noise interference uh, other than the sample. And that interference is going to be coming from the actual, uh, the actual mobile phase, which is liquid. It says here sample signal must be three times the noise of the detector for it to be read. It just cancels, cancels all this stuff out. Gas uh, chromatography uh, detectors only respond to the sample. Liquid uh, 
chromatography detects response to the mobile phase as well as the sample. So when you use gas, uh, you know, when you use our column in the gas, we just we just um, measure the um, the sample itself. But in liquid, again, the detectors respond to the mobile phase, which is a liquid, as well as the sample. So the type of detectors, you get a ref, uh, refractive index. So it's, it's going to bend light. Optic absorbance. So we use UV, ultraviolet, visible, or infrared light. And how much the um, sample absorbs this light is detected. So that's optic absorbance. UV fluorescence. Um, some compounds, when you shine UV on them, they illuminate and light comes off of it. And I'll show you how those work. And the last one is electroconductivity. And that would be for our ion source. So refractive index. The bending of the light rays refraction at the boundary between two different transparent materials, glass and air. And that's just an example. So how does this work? You have a lamp and you're shining a light through here. Um, and when it hits the sample, some of it goes straight through and that's because it, it ignores the actual um, solvent. And the reason it ignores the solvent is because this is full of solvent. So once it hits this and goes through a glass or air, or whatever it is that separates them, because this light's shining through the solvent, it doesn't refract at all. It just keeps going straight through. Now, because there's no um, there's no sample in, in here, or no compounds, it's only the, the solvent reference. If it hits a compound, it refracts. It comes down, hits this mirror, and comes through again, and hits this light detector. Now, there could be many compounds, many different compounds, and where it hits this detector, um, and when it hits this detector is going to determine what the compound is. So low sensitivity can detect all sample types, requires comp constant temperature. Again, this would be in the oven, um, and it requires constant temperature to maintain the results, that we don't have any um, fluctuations because of the temperature. Because the re re uh, reference contains a sample solvent as a mobile phase, there is no refraction. So when I when I shine that light through this through the solvent, the solvent's in here too. So there's no refraction. That's all they're saying. The amount of refraction is proportional to the concentration of the sample. So how much it refracts is going to be proportional to the concentration of the sample that we're that we're analyzing. Optical absorbance detector. Now this is all about light absorbance. So here we got UV, visible, infrared light, whatever we're using. We've got a transparent window here. <clears throat> this is the sample and the liquid phase from the column. It goes through our sample and then out to waste. So we shine this light through. This is a transparent windows. And then they have a light detector here, um, which, which um, detects how much light is absorbed um, with a reference of how much light is being given. So it uses UV, visible, or infrared light, depending on the compound we're measuring. Um, different compounds absorb different lights, so we have to know uh, what we're measuring so we know which light to use. Different com compounds absorb different lights. Sample concentration is proportional to the absorbance of the light. So how much that sample absorbs is proportional to the sample concentration. Calibration of compounds det determines the response factor. Again, once we calibrate this uh, analyzer, chromatograph, we get a response factor to that certain compound. And we talked about that the first time on the first ILM. Can only be used with solvents that do not absorb the same light as the detector. Okay, well, that makes pretty, pretty good sense because then we're not measuring the amount of solvent that's going through there. We're measuring the amount of compound. So when we have a solvent, it can't absorb the same light as uh, our compounds do. It has to be completely different or doesn't absorb. 
UV light is absorbed by double bonded compounds like alkene and aer aromatics. A little bit of third year stuff here. So that's what we use it. That's what we use it for. Ultraviolet fluorescent detector. In this case here, <clears throat> we have uh, UV light shining through a glass window, another glass window. On this side to the detect, or no, this is the detector here. So what happens here from the column, uh, the, uh, the samples get pumped through the sample cell and out to waste. You have transparent windows. When you, when you um, shine this light on it, uh, it causes, well, basically it causes visible light or fluorescence it's called. Um, it's like a uh, fluorescent tube, when mercury tube, when you uh, put um, your high voltage across it, uh, you get fluorescent light off your, off your tubes. Well, this happens the same way with some of the samples, depending what we're using. So we need an ultraviolet fluorescent detector for some samples that are going through here. And once the UV light hits it, it, it gives visible light and fluorescence come off it, go through this glass window to this light detector. So compounds emit visible light after absorbing the UV. Toxic polyaromatic cardiocarbons, PAH, in food and environment. So that's what it's used, uh, one of these is ultra, um, the ultraviolet fluorescent detector. So it's for, for toxins in food and environment. Most sensitive of all detectors emitted light proportional to the concentration. So how much light is emitted from my sample to my light detector is going to be proportional to the concentration of the polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And in the, in, on page 13, it also tells you what, the, uh, what, what a polyaromatic hydrocarbon is. And all it is is, is two, few, two or more fused benzene rings. So I just threw that in there so that when, we, when you see nap, naphthalene or polyaromatic poly hydrocarbons or benzene rings, um, when we talk about that, we're going to be talking about ultraviolet fluorescent detector with our liquid chromatography. That's, this is why you took chemistry in third year, I guess. Okay, electrical conductivity detectors, and this is for the ions. Um, so you have a, uh, for, uh, you have an ion exchange column. Um, again, we talked about low vo low volume cell, metal electrodes, and then of course the sample and the, the mobile phase liquid goes to waste. So measure conductivity due to the presence of sample ions from an ion exchange column. Use a salt water sodium hydroxide as a mobile phase. Uh, constant temperature is needed to prevent conductivity drifting up and down. We all know that if uh, heat, uh, uh, conductivity is dependent on heat or the change in heat. Here we got low volume cell. So in, in, our, in our sample cell, it's low volume. So it reduces the amount of mobile phase that's in there. So you get a better representation uh, from a conductivity. Uh, your metal electrodes are AC powered. And the reason they're AC powered is because, as you know, alternating current goes on and off and off. So it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And what it does is it keeps the plates clean. If you had DC going through here, these plates would build up. But going back and forth, back and forth, these plates stay clean. Chemical suppression. Now, this is in your book, too, and this is talking about using uh, water, salt, sodium hydroxide. So chemical suppression chemically reduces the background conductivity of the mobile phase. This improves the measurement of ions of interest. So chemically, it reduces the ions in the um, mobile phase. So then you're, you're only going to get um, conductivity from uh, the sample. Learning, uh, learning objective number three, describe sample systems and sample conditioning as they apply to a chromatograph. So here's a process pipe. We've got a process pipe here. 
Here's where we get uh, the higher pressure um, is here where the lower pressure is here. So the sample goes in through here. We have an analyzer takeoff point. So some of the uh, uh, some of the sample goes into the sample conditioning unit, and then it just keeps going. And this uh, the, the remainder of it keeps going back and returns to the process flow. And because uh, it's at a lower pressure, so it, it it just eventually makes its way, and it's called our fast loop. So process comes out. It's got higher pressure, lower pressure here. So this here is called our fast loop. And then at this point, we take some um, some of the sample into the sampling condition unit, um, and then into the chromatograph, and then into the waste handling system because um, what we're taking out of this uh, may be hazardous. So these operate continuously and unattended. So these could be on stack gas stacks. It could be somewhere high. They could uh, so. Uh, we'll have to have a program controller in, in the uh, in the system to tell us if it's working properly. But a lot of times, um, these sample conditioning units operate continuously and are unattended. Sample system does not include the chromatograph. Um, they're making this uh, statement just because the sample system causes a lot of errors. That's where you get most of your errors and it's not into in the chromatograph. So the sample system does not include the chromatograph. It, a, it, it includes the sampling conditioning unit and it also includes um, the waste handling system. The chromatograph in the sample system is the analyzer system. So when I look at this, uh, this and this and this fast loop are part of the sample conditioning um, and the, all three of these are part of the analyzer system. Um, not positive why they, they isolate these things out, but I think what they're saying is that because most of the, most of the um, error comes with the sampling system, um, we don't want to include this chromatograph because the chromatograph could be working perfectly fine and we're getting errors because of the sampling condition. Um, when we have a waste handling system, we need to get rid of that waste. Um, and, and one of the best ways, if it can be done, is you take that waste handling, whatever's coming through, and you put it back in, into the process. So handling the waste is an issue all the time. The best scenario is to put it back in the process. Hazardous waste should not be vented into the analyzer shack. Um, this will be coming, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but. Um, you don't, if you have an analyzer shack, most of your wastes are vented outside. We don't want to, we don't want to uh, vent our waste into the shack or into any building. It's got to be secure. So uh, the best place to do this is pump it right back into uh, the process. Sample system components. Most problems are caused by the failure of sample system. The sample system has to achieve a representative sample. That's the most important thing the sample system has to do. Composition of a sample must match the original. So whatever I'm taking out of my process, by the time it gets uh, through the sample system, it has to be representative of the process. Sample transport time, um, it should be less than 60 seconds. That's what they're trying, that's what they're saying in the, in the ILM is it. That sample transport time's got to be quick. Sample conditioning. So we remove uh, solids that could damage the valves. We remove liquids that could damage the stationary phase. Those are the things we remove. So <clears throat> particle filters. Here again is your fast loop. This is a continuation of your process. Um, you've got a bypass filter here. So uh, this is your analyzer takeoff point. You got your sample conditioning unit. You have an inline filter before it gets to the chromatograph. Chromatographs must be protected from particles larger than two microns. And it's telling you here that um, the one micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. 
So the, we're talking small, small particles that the uh, chromatograph has to be protected from. This is a typical question, right? How, how, how large is the micron? How large um, must the uh, basically the filter uh, remove from the sample conditioning unit? Inline filters, <clears throat> and they're called guard filters. So the sample goes in here, goes through here, and here you have this porous metal element, which will uh, let two microns and lower through and stop anything else. Now these filters, this is a screw off cap, it just screws off and then you replace the filter if it gets plugged. So it's not a big expense. And this, this here is out to the column. So trapped solids and replaceable porous metal. So again, this, this, this cap is screwed and you can see the, um, the threads here. Screw off the cap and put a new filter in if it gets plugged. Have small internal volume. Um, so what they're saying here is the, the less volume it has, um, uh, the faster the, the um, sample goes through, so it reduces lag time. All of the sample passes through the filter. So this is a cylindrical bypass filter. And again, this filter also has, your, your, it's, it's your fast loop in. You got a, sl a cylindrical filament element right here. And again, this will screw out and you can replace that filter too. Portion of the sample passes through the filter in installed at the takeoff point in a fast loop. So that's, bef that's before your sample system. Liquid separation, knocks, knockout pots remove heavy droplets that fall out of the gas phase. Coalescing fill, uh, separates remove tiny droplets, normally in mist. And here on page 19, if you look, um, here's your fast loop. You have a pressure regulator, coalescent filter, and membrane. Uh, you have a membrane separated with liquid shutoff. And then you have that inline filter, which is your particles. So these two filters are for water, moisture, mist, things like that, through the chromatograph and then the, and then the analyzer. So if I look in this table on page 19, here's my sample type. So if I get clean, dry gas, all I need is this inline filter only. So all I need is this. These don't have to be there because they remove mist and water droplets. Small amounts of routine solids and liquids. So inline filter, particles, coalescing filter, and membrane separator. And this one here, small amounts of routine solids plus liquids and occasional excessive amounts of liquid. We need a shut off. So we got an inline filter for the particles. We got a coalescing filter um, uh, for, for small amounts of routine solid and liquids. Uh, we have a filter membrane. And then we have a liquid shut off. Not liquid shut off, it sh will shut off uh, right here and won't let anything through. And then we've got to go and fix this analyzer, fix the sample system of this analyzer. Learning four multi stream sample switching techniques. So this is when we take one sample, one, one um, chromatograph, and we are measuring different streams. So multi-stream multi sample switching is, is the issue. So it connects a single chromatograph to multiple sample streams. This is page 21 and 22. So the problems with this, cross-contamination between the streams. So if I've got three streams coming in and I've got all this valving for these streams to shut one off and turn the other one on and um, th there's a lot of potential for cross-contamination. Lag time. So depending how these streams are hooked up um, and we're going to show you that, I'm going to show you that uh, in the next few slides. Uh, lag time means stop stream flow. If I shut one of the streams down, or two of the streams down out of the three, and I, I analyze the third one, 
Well, there is dead time and lag time from that stopped sample that's in, in the tubing of the other streams. So that can become an issue too, because now you're not getting a representative sample. Um, ball valves are tighter shut off than solenoid valves. Uh, some multi-stream sample switching uses uh, solenoid valves, and they're not as tight a shut off as ball valves. So the ball valves uh, have a tighter shut off, and they prevent cross contamination. Um, you don't want any of the. You want a tight shut off valve. So solenoid valve. When I look at this, this will be on our schematic. Uh, black is closed, so I, I've got my black here. This is closed, so nothing's going through. I've got my white. These are these are open. Uh, this is a solenoid valve symbol. <clears throat> Arrow is in the direction of the sample. And of course, there's a vent too on some of these. If the three ways, if they're three or two ways, three ways usually have a vent on them. So again, here's your this this will be this will be um, <clears throat> on here. This will be a sample coming in. And if I shut that, that has to be vented again. The same issue here. You've got to vent that and you've got to take that back and treat this as hazardous or, or get rid of the waste. So when we look at the schematic, when we look at these schematics, all, black is closed, white is open. Now, when we talk about uh, ball valves and stuff, and in your ILM and on page 121 and 22, it talks about uh, pneumatic operated ball valves. So this is a pneumatic operated ball valve. You can see the pneumatic here. Um, and it's and it's comes from the controller, which opens and closes these valves. So you have electronic signal here to a solenoid valve. This is an instrument air supply. So this will turn on and off and basically will open and close this ball valve. <coughs> Excuse me. So this, um, this works better when you need a tight shut off. When a, when a tight shut off is critical, uh, you'll use your solenoid valves to operate your ball valves. And um, it explains a little bit about that, uh, about the designers and stuff. If they want a ball valve they, to, to get better shut off in these multi-stream sample switching. Okay, so when we talk about multi, when we talk about multi-stream, um, the first one we talk about is simple double block and bleed on page 23. So again, in this case here, I've got all the things that we talked about with dead leg and um, solenoid valves and all that kind of stuff, and which stream we're sampling. So in this case, um, symbol double block and bleed, it says prevents leaky valves from producing cross-contamination, but still suffers from contamination from dead leg and lag time from stop flow. So if we talk about this, we got condition stream number one comes through. This is open. So this solenoid valve is open. It goes through, comes through here and to the analyzer. So obviously, all three of these samples have to meet somewhere when they, before they go to the analyzer. So in this case here, we've got all this, what, what's in here, not flowing at all. In this case here, this is just a valve. It's, if, if this one leaks, this one's supposed to stop it, right? So in case, this case here, I've got a double block and bleed. I've blocked it here on stream two, and I've blocked it here. And anything in between goes out to waste or vent. Same thing as three. Once I've once the program controller picks one, three is also shut. So it's shut here. There's a double block here, and then there's a bleed comes through here. Doesn't deal with this stuff in here, which is going to contaminate coming through here because when the flow flows through this way, it's also going to cause a vacuum and pull some of this from the other two streams in. Not only that, you have unpurged dead legs here. So the, this, these dead legs um, offer bad, poor lag time and poor representative samples, all that kind of good stuff. So this is a double block and bleed. 
Double block and bleed with back purge. So this is on page 24. So this prevents leaky valves from producing cross contamination and removes dead leg with back purge, but still suffers from lag time due to stop flow. So in this case here, again, we're, we're working on stream one uh, for simplicity. We always have stream one open. Stream one opens, goes down through here and to the analyzer. Also with the stream one, it purges this because this is open and it takes this to, to vent. So all of these are taken through vent through the back purge of the stream that we're analyzing. So I'm analyzing stream number one. It's flowing through these two solenoids, goes to the analyzer, but also purges out these two valves. <coughs> so it's still a double block and bleed because I've got this, I've got this here and then another valve. So if this was shot on two and this is shot, there's your double block and it bleeds out through the vent, which we have to take care of. And this of course opens and you notice these are manually operated valves. So that's kind of a pain because if you're manually operated, that means every time we switch a stream, we've got to go out there and actually close these or open these or whatever we have to do. But you can see how this works. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> With the flow going through here and purging out the other two stream valves, just the, the back of the valve. So the, the only thing this does is, is uh, improves producing cross-contamination. The dead leg is still going to be there. And that's on page 24. And the last one that we, we use, continuous flow. So this prevents leaky valves from producing cross-contamination, removes dead leg with back purge, and decreases lag time with constant flow. So this is the one we'd want to use um, if we uh, uh, if we really want to get rid of cross contamination and really want to get rid of uh, dead leg. So again, uh, here's your valves from your process. This is all your process. Here's your valves. Uh, this one's open on stream one, so stream one comes through here, goes through here and also goes to your analyzer. It also back purges this and gets rid of the dead leg and back purges this, gets rid of the dead leg. So all of this here past the second block and bleed is, is being moved. And of course, all of everything that comes out of these is being sent to the back purge vent. Stream two is here and it's closed and closed. So there's your double block and then your, your bleed is right here going through the back. So this is called a continuous flow. So those are multi-sampling multi streams and uh, some of the, the three different types that are in the ILM uh, and also some of the uh, reasons that they use them as far as getting rid of cross-contamination getting rid of the dead leg and uh, decreasing lag time. Question? Uh, would it, for most likely the single block and bleed, would it not be uncommon to see uh, check valves right at the T before they go down the sample line? That way to reduce uh, any leaking? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you look at that and you think that'd be a great idea when you go back to just, the, just this right here, right? No, this one have a check valve in there or any of these have a check valve so it can't come back. But that would be only be in this one because that's the only one that uh, it doesn't have backflow, right? So this single simple, doc, uh, um, simple block and bleed, um, there's no check valve here because what happens is this just stays. We want this flow to, to remove all of this dead leg. So that's why we put in these, uh, right, continual flows. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know where a check valve would serve a purpose um, because you still have that dead leg. Obviously, continuous flow the best. All right.
getting to near to the end of the ILM, describe the hazard and safe work practices re related to chromatography and their sample systems. Um, this is stuff you already know, but we'll talk about it anyway. Um, this, this is just from your ILM or your programmer electronics that you have high voltage hazards. Uh, detector enclosure, hot detection surface, um, oven enclosure, uh, flammable and toxic samples, carrier gas leaks. This carrier gas leak is, um, why are we concerned about that? Most of the time it's helium, which is inert, but what do we use instead of helium for better conductivity? Better for heat? We use hydrogen. hydrogen. Yeah. <clears throat> you got the oven heater, hot internal surfaces. Um, again, and all of this is inside of a, a shack of some sort of shack, an analyzer shack. So explosion caused by flammable, flammable gases, toxic gas exposure, electrical shock, burns from high temperature, high pressure liquid solvents. They can be up to 5,000 PSI. Safety features, process chromatograph. We use several types of electrical safety protection in hazardous areas. So we all know about intrinsically safe from first year, cannot release enough electrical or thermal energy, cause ignition, purging, uh, exchanging room or enclosure, ha uh, hazardous air with non-hazardous air, pressurization, positive pressure, with non-hazardous air to prevent hazardous gases from entering, all this kind of stuff. Explosion-proof equipment and housing will contain the explosion within the equipment closures, so ignition will cause, uh, so no ignition will cause an ambient explosion. Surface temperature ratings of your equipment. Um, uh, and here we got uh, electrical protection, intrinsically safe for oven heater, purging, uh, controller and oven closures, pressurization, control electronic modules and oven enclosures, and explosion proof housing for detectors. So you may or may not have this depending on what we're sampling and what we're analyzing. Sample system uh, hazards, location where the technician could be exposed to uh, flammable and toxic materials. Um, again, here's your sample transport, sample conditioning, uh, we can have toxic, all, all these places where there's valves. Sample conditioning unit may fail. Here's the analyzer shack, or they call it a house in here, where the analyzer. Um, sample recovery system and waste sampling, that's huge. Uh, if I can get this sample recovery and this waste back into the, uh, into the process, that's the best place for it. And this here, if hydrogen gas is used as carrier gas, there's a potential for explosion. So your analyzer in here, and if you have hydrogen gases in here, um, that's where your potential comes from. Page 29. Uh, when you're using all your gases, so your, cylinder, your carrier gases, your hydrogen, your helium, any other gases that you'll need, uh, we have these pressure, high pressure tanks. And again, they need to be strapped up. Um, I've heard stories, but never seen it where they fall in and they, they knock off the regulator or valve and they act as a missile projection. I've never seen it, but I've heard it. So the gas cylinder safety may contain toxic flammable or inert gases at high pressures. Calibration gases must be kept above the dew point of their, uh, or their composition may change. Uh, secure bottles so they don't become projectiles if the accident falls. The shutoff valve breaks off. And that's pretty much it. But the summary, liquid uh, chromatography operates at the same principle as gas, but requires a high pressure pump and different detector designs for handling liquids. It's important to understand the operation of a, a sample system and multi-stream switching to ensure a clean representative sample is provided to the chromatograph. And there are many different hazards may be present, uh, present on a chromatograph. A clear understanding of these will ensure proper safety precautions are followed when working with the analyzer. And then you'll answer the rest of the questions. Let me, just, let me go here and...
close this off. I will uh, stop sharing this. Here we go. Stop recording. Stop sharing. Okay. So in a nutshell, that was uh, liquid chromatography, uh, part B. Any questions on that? Oh, there you go, Brett. Brett, you have your hand up? I had asked about the check valves earlier. Okay. I'll cancel that out. I didn't see that. I don't know why I didn't see that. But... Okay. When I, when I had that... Uh, um, PowerPoint up. I didn't see. I didn't see that hand come up. That's odd. Anyway, you can, uh, you can hear the chime. Like when I when I hit it here, you'll hear this noise. Oh, okay. So once that comes in, then you know. And if there's multiple questions, they number them for whoever raised their hand first. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. But all right, Tim. Well, thanks a lot, man. Okay. You betcha. I don't know when I'll see you next. I'll be up to Tyler and I, and we'll just uh, we'll just make sure that uh, we relay the information on to you. And I'm not sure. I think Tyler is doing another uh, um, presentation today. I'm not positive. He, you, you guys would know. Yeah, I think we just got you for today, and then Tyler will be back tomorrow. Okay. All right, man. All right. Okay, boys. See you later. Thank you. You bet.